And welcome to Law and Crime Now, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us. We have a full show for you. We're going to start right now with a police-involved shooting out of Wisconsin. This is from a video that went absolutely viral. It appears to show an officer shooting 29-year-old Jacob Blake in the back multiple times as he enters into an SUV. And the man's children were reportedly in the car as well. Now, Blake has survived, and he is in stable condition. I want to start with the video itself. Take a look. Okay, now that shooting has led to massive protests, some of which have been violent. Uh, the officers have been put on administrative leave. The state DOJ is currently investigating the matter, and they're going to prepare a report for the state prosecutor. Uh, Blake's family has retained renowned civil rights attorney Benjamin Crump. So there's a lot to get into, and I want to bring on my guests immediately to get into this. I'm joined now by Law and Crime Network's Terry Austin, forensic death investigator from Jacksonville State University, Joseph Scott Morgan, and Law and Crime legal analyst Gene Rossi. Great to have everybody here. Terry, let me start with you. So the DOJ is investigating. They're going to prepare a report for the prosecutor. Could the officer or officers face charges, and what could they face? They absolutely could face charges, Jesse. This is a horrendous crime. They could face attempted murder charges. They could face assault, which would be less than that. But clearly, the officer who shot the gun, and if he shot seven times, he was trying to at least assault the individual or kill the individual. You could certainly argue that. So I think this is one of those cases where the will be an investigation, and the investigation will show that there was some intent here. Jacob Blake was shot in the back, and he's fortunate that he survived. And the other issue, Jesse, is that the children were in the car. What were these individuals thinking when they shot these fires? That's a good point. What, what was anybody thinking here? Because, Gene, I want to turn it to you. And there's a lot of details we don't know yet. And obviously, there's more to the story. But when you think about George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Rayshard Brooks, we're living in a climate right now where you would imagine police would use more restraint, that they wouldn't immediately get into this. So what exactly were they thinking here? I mean, we are living in a very different world here, Gene. What's going on? I'm going to put on my defense attorney's hat. I'm not saying it's a great argument. The only possible argument I can think of for those officers to rely on is that when he went, uh, Mr. Blake went into the car, he was trying to get a firearm. That's the only possible way they can defend this case. Only possible way. Self-defense. But uh, Terry brought up a good point. The kids are in the car. He's not going into the car to get a gun. He's probably going in a car to calm the kids down. And the seven shots occurred almost after he opened the door to the car. There was no attempt to get him out of the car. I think these officers panic, but, but panic is not going to be a defense if those are the facts. Yeah, you mentioned seven shots. Joseph, how on earth is he alive? It's a miracle that this man is alive. So we have covered multiple uh, shooting-related incidents on this program before. Seven shots. What can we make of that, Joseph? Yeah, you know, again, we're saying that there are seven shots, and I've heard other people say that he was shot seven times. I don't have any confirmation of that yet. I don't know. You would think at that range that there's a high likelihood that they would have been on target, but that remains to be seen. And also, we're at a disadvantage because the video that we're watching starts in one spot. I don't know what happened prior to that. But I can tell you some of the questions that are going to come up. They're going to talk about things like the force continuum. Uh, they're going to talk about, uh, you know, uh, lethal versus non-lethal force. I've heard a lot of chatter about people, why weren't tasers uh, deployed at this point? This thing happened very quickly. Uh, council mentioned just a moment ago that there may be panic involved. I don't know, but I know that this officer uh, did fire. Uh, obviously, uh, his weapon multiple times. The other officer is essentially backing off and not joining in. Of course, he's not going to at that point in time because there's a weapon being discharged. You know, you kind of, 
that's off the table at that point. You know, you can't put your hands on him at that point yeah. if you're drawn down on him. So I, I don't know. I, I'll be very anxious to see these reports when they come out. Terry, let me ask you this. Unlike other cases, obviously there's body cam footage that hasn't been released yet, but you have clearly some video, eyewitnesses, and the victim of this shooting is alive. So in terms of a defense, which Gene and I went into a little bit, it seems that the officer or officers uh, will have a, a different kind of battle than any other case that we've covered here. I think they're going to have a very difficult battle, Jesse, because to your point, we have some video and we do have some eyewitnesses involved. And I think just looking at the video, and we know that Benjamin Crump is an excellent attorney, and if he has that video, I do think that he is going to pursue criminal charges or have the state pursue criminal charges against the police officer who shot the gun, and maybe even some civil charges as far as that's concerned, so there can be some monetary reward here for what occurred. But yeah, I think that the fact that there were seven shots they could have disabled Blake before shooting so many times, even if there was a gun involved and the police investigation is going to show whether or not that's the case. They could have stopped him. And I do think there was a taser. Joseph mentioned that they could have done that. Based on one of the reports I saw, I think they did at least take out their taser. So lots of questions, Jesse, and it remains to be seen what the real facts are. So LaQuisha Booker is uh, Jacob Blake's fiance. Here's what she told the local media outlet about what happened with the shooting. You overused it. That's what you did. You shot him numerous times for no reason. It didn't take all that. Disregard that my kids was in the car at all. And you knew they was in there because I kept screaming at before y'all even made it to the other side of the driver's side to get him in the car. I've been yelling at the whole time. Let me get my kids. Yeah, Gene, we're trying to make sense of what happened here, and you said put your defense cap on. Now, again, more details need to come out, but if officers uh, were responding to a domestic violence incident, and I believe there are reports out there of, uh, you know, B uh, Blake's possible criminal past, do officers keep that in mind when they respond, and does that somehow affect their defense in saying, look, we, we went into this domestic violence incident with an idea of who Blake is, and perhaps that's what led the officer to open fire. Not justifying it, because every take every situation as it is, but could that change the story at all or help them in any way? Gray and criminal intent, are, are, of course, are key elements of any criminal charge. So what the officers or officer had in his brain before he approached this car, it could have been he has a long criminal record. There's a gun involved. There's an allegation of violence. If that was all in his head before he approached, then that would help him in any defense. But the fiance provides very good evidence that counters that. She's kind of saying, the kids are in the car. We got to think about them. That, that kind of supports the argument that Mr. Blake was going into the car to pro probably try to calm the kids. The other fact, and this is sort of the Monday morning quarterback. The other fact that will hurt the officers, if there's no gun or knife or weapon in the car, that's going to hurt their defense because uh, he was probably going into the car, Mr. Blake was, to calm his right. kids. And that will, that will hurt the officers. They can say, you know what, there was no gun, but in my head, I thought he was reaching for a gun. But looking at that video, right. he did not look like a guy going into his car to get the gun. So, Joseph, what goes into processing this crime scene now? Uh, thankfully, the medical examiner, the coroner, doesn't have to get involved. I mean, the, again, miraculously, he survived this. But right. what goes into processing that crime scene to understand what happened here? Uh, well, you know, obviously we have the video record from across the street, but also what's going to be key are going to be uh, the cams uh, that the police officers hopefully had running at the time. And also prior to that, I don't know if this was affected by a traffic stop initially and they had run this guy through NCIC or what had happened. I have none of the history to kind of back this up. But as far as the physical evidence at the scene, um, that officer's weapon, 
uh, would have been taken yesterday at that moment in time. He would have had to have surrendered his weapon at the scene. They'll collect all of those spent casings, the ejected rounds that are coming out, and then the recovered projectiles that pass through uh, Mr. Blake's body or any shots that went wild into the car, uh, those will be collected. Yeah. Trajectories will be drawn to show kind of the attitude between the police officer at the end of the muzzle and where the round wound up. And all of that's going to be kind of formed into a picture, a forensic picture of uh, what exactly went down. They'll talk about things like range of fire and, and all those sorts of things, the physical evidence. I, I think that part is going to be kind of elementary. I'm going to be very mm -hmm. interested to see what the videography says prior to. And look, at this point, based upon what we do know, uh, people are outraged by this. There is a, a ton of public support for the Blake family. And it'll be curious and interesting to see all elements of what happened, because just looking at it from face value, none of it makes sense. But it is a case that we will continue to follow here as it progresses on Long Crime Now. When we come back, huge update in the Scott Peterson case. We'll be right back right after this. Welcome back, everybody. Major development in a case that helped to define the true crime era. We have just learned that the California Supreme Court has officially overturned the death sentence for convicted murderer Scott Peterson. You go back to 2004, Peterson was found guilty and sentenced to death for killing his pregnant wife, Lacey, and their unborn child, Connor. We covered his appeal hearing on law and crime, and one of the main arguments from the defense that the trial judge improperly excluded jurors from the case. We saw how that unfolded in real time. Take a look. Let me go then to the next juror, juror 8340. This juror, this juror was strongly opposed to the death penalty, as opposed to simply, uh, as opposed to simply opposed uh, in the prior juror. And this juror also said, however, that her views would not preclude her from imposing death. And the trial court discharged this juror because, quote, the juror is excused because the juror is opposed to the death penalty on religious grounds. And that's true. She did state the source of her opposition was religious grounds. And in fact, that's the primary reason the state defends this, uh, defends this discharge. Uh, there are two reasons, but the primary reason is that the source of her opposition was religious. And the second point the state makes is that she preferred life without parole. She said she preferred it in her questionnaire. And I want to make an additional comment on each of these. Uh, the state's focus on the source of this juror's opposition to the death penalty uh, completely misapprehends Witherspoon. And they do this, I, one of the reasons this juror is useful is because the state focuses on source with a number of the 13 jurors I've identified. Witherspoon does not say you can discharge depending on the source. Regardless of the source, the Witherspoon inquiry focuses on whether the juror can set aside the views, whether the views are religious based, philosophically based, morally based, financially based. The Witherspoon inquiry is about setting those views aside, not the source. Uh, and we, we don't have to look any further then I believe this court's decisions in Woodruff and Gwen Mostro and Zaragoza to know that the fact that a juror has a religious basis for their opposition is not in and of itself sufficient to discharge them based solely on the juror questionnaire. That leaves the state with one other additional factor about this juror they say that, that justify the discharge, and that is that she preferred life without parole. And let me be frank with the court and concede this, that every juror who is opposed to the death penalty will prefer life without parole. It is the flip side of the same coin. After all, if you're opposed to the death penalty and you're asked what your views are of the death penalty or life without parole, you're going to prefer life without parole. That's what being against the death penalty is all about. It's the flip side of the same coin. Uh, saying that you cannot discharge someone for opposition to the death penalty, but you can discharge them because they prefer life without parole, is it's a shell game. Now, Gene, it seems that the uh, Supreme Court here sided with this argument and felt that the trial judge didn't do a good thing by getting rid of these jurors, right? I mean, well, how did they come to this landmark decision? I got to tell you, Clint Gardner is brilliant. He, he, <laughs> he's brilliant. Um, 
Here's how they, they came to the conclusion. There are two types of striking of jurors. One is the peremptory strike. I, I, as a defense attorney or prosecutor, especially in a death penalty case, I can strike a juror for any reason other than race and gender, okay, as long as I have some reasonable independent basis, all right? What the judge did, which causes reversal, is that for a boatload of jurors, he mentioned 13, I'm sure there were more, I think, for a boatload of jurors, the judge said, I'm going to strike these jurors for cause, not even peremptory, for cause. This is when the judge, based on information, says that juror can't be fair. And Mr. Gardner brought up a brilliant point. So what? If you're Catholic, the Pope says the death yep. penalty is wrong. Just because you're Catholic and you believe in the Pope and the infallibility of the Pope, does that mean you can never serve on a jury or the death penalty case? That's absurd. So what the judge did is he took that religious belief or the position and said, that by itself is a reason you can't serve on this jury. I think it's, a, I think it's a, an excellent decision, frankly. Yeah, it, it makes sense. But now, Terry, the question is, what does the state do? Because let's not forget, his convictions stay where they are. Court upheld those convictions. The trial, guilt phase, that's done. The question is, does the state now retry the penalty phase? And, and the, there, was a spokes, uh, there was a statement from the, um, the county district attorney that says, we're going to review the decision, we'll discuss with the victim's family on what to do next. But your best guess, Terry, do they now retry the penalty phase to get the death penalty again? And what would that even look like? I think that is what will occur. And what it'll look like is this time, Gene really said it perfectly. Those four cause strikes are unlimited. And if the judge, in fact, said, because of your religious beliefs, all of you are stricken from the jury, that really does deny the defendant his constitutional right. And I do think the judge made the right decision in keeping the conviction, the guilt portion, but making sure that they overturn the penalty portion. And yes, I think the state should retry that portion and make sure that jurors who are on can see both sides. The fact is, if a juror says, I will apply the law, it doesn't matter what their beliefs are. If they say they will apply the law, mm -hmm. then you have to take them for their word. So I do think we're going to see a retry of the penalty phase. Because in other words, the Peterson uh, jury at that time was just all in favor of the death penalty. That was the defense's argument. Now, uh, Joseph, I want to turn it to you because this is a case that you and I had discussed what do you make of it? You knew about this from back in the day, and now with this massive development, people have followed this case from when it first began in 2002. What do you make of this? Uh, as, Tom, as time has gone by for me, I've covered this case for so long, you know, it's, um, I'm sick to the back teeth of it, personally. I'm no attorney, obviously. Uh, but I have uh, participated in cases where the death penalty was at stake. And actually, interestingly enough, a little factoid, I've assisted in the autopsy of uh, two individuals that were uh, executed in the state of Georgia. And I remember, you know, back then thinking, uh, what a waste, uh, what a waste of time this is for everybody. At this point, these guys had languished on death row. Uh, you know, when it comes to Scott Peterson, for me personally, and again, this is only my personal uh, uh, view, uh, I, I wish that we just never had to say his name again. He's stuck into a, dark, a deep, dark hole. There, if it says no possibility of parole, then there's no possibility of parole. He's never resurfaced again. And so uh, for me, right. I just, I want the thing to be over with. Well, look, he has been sitting on death row uh, in California. Gavin Newsom, G Governor Gavin Newsom has put a halt on the death penalty while he's in office. So this is, we're just going to see which way this plays out. But what a decision that, uh, I got to tell you, probably surprised a lot of people who were following this. Now, I want to turn to another defendant, a defendant whose trial we covered here on Law and Crime, and that's Markeith Lloyd. He was convicted of murdering his pregnant ex-girlfriend, Sade Dixon, and he's supposed to have an upcoming trial for the killing of Orlando police officer Deborah Clayton. Authorities say that he gunned her down while he was on the run from law enforcement in regards to the Dixon killing. But now his attorney, Thomas Lennon, is saying that this trial, this second one, 
should be thrown out because of something called collateral estoppel. Hmm. Now, before we get into that, let's actually play a little bit of something here because this was the defense's closing argument from uh, Mr. Lenneman, where he basically says, you know, jury, you're not going to, you're going to hear very limited information about the Deborah Clayton incident. So just look at it in a specific way. This was important. Take a look. So now we get to the Walmart. And why is the Walmart important? The Walmart is important because there is a limited instruction that the judge gave you on what's called consciousness of guilt or identity. So in other words, there is evidence that was presented to you that Mr. Lloyd went to Walmart and he discharged a firearm and Sergeant Clayton was involved in the discharge of the firearm and they recovered the casings from the same firearm that he used in the Dixon case, in Sade's case, in Ron's case, at the actual scene of the Walmart. And so they compare those two, and the law allows them to present to you that you can consider because he was fleeing or acting in a way to get away from Sergeant Clayton, that you can use that to show, number one, that he's the same person that was involved in the Dixon shooting, or number two, that he did so because of a consciousness of guilt, that that's the reason he flees and he shoots in that particular case. That's the only limited purpose that you can use that. And for those of you who said that you knew about the Clayton shooting, you were instructed by the judge numerous times, you can't consider this, you can't consider that, you can't consider it, and you can't. That case will have 12 jurors on another day consider that evidence. <laughs> Okay, so Gene, explain it to non-lawyers out there. This idea of collateral estoppel, that's what his attorney's saying. He's saying that this new trial about Deborah Clayton, first jury heard things about it, and that's kind of why they can't have this second trial. What is he, say, what is he arguing here? Well, what, it's it, based on a Supreme Court case, I think, that was decided around nine, uh, 1993, where if the government uses the same facts to convict an individual on crime A, you can't use those same facts again to convict on crime B. Here, crime A is the girlfriend, Miss uh, Dixon, being murdered. And of course, the second one is the, uh, the, the female officer, uh, L uh, Lieutenant Clayton. That argument is that those same facts in the first trial can't be used collaterally again in the second. The problem with that argument is it doesn't violate double jeopardy. There's a Supreme Court case called Felix of 1994 that says each crime is element-based. It's not fact-based. So you can use the same facts in crime A, and you can use them in the same trial as crime B, and that's okay if the elements are different. There are two elements that are different here. Different victims, different murders. So their argument doesn't hold water under the Supreme Court. You know, Joseph, from your perspective, uh, killings of law enforcement, uh, we could argue day and night about the legal aspect of it, but it almost seems from a political aspect that it's important to have this trial. And I'm curious, from your perspective, from your career, uh, you know, this case is just is, is very important to get into a courtroom. Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, my heart broke over the death of this lieutenant uh, mother, uh, and she, I, you know, it's like she just walked right into a buzzsaw. Uh, she, I don't know that she really could have predicted what happened. This guy's very violent. Do you remember, I don't know if you recall this, but you know, you and I were actually covering, I think, the day that he made his initial appearance when he started screaming in court and whatnot. And, you know, I remember both of us raised an eyebrow at that particular time, Jesse, uh, thinking, wow, what does the future hold? You know, at, at the time with the the death of his, uh, of his girlfriend, at that time, we covered that. But, you know, I remember us talking about what the lieutenant's trial was going to be like. Uh, and 
Uh, yeah, I think that it it does. This is something that does need to be open to the public. We need to cover it from gavel to gavel like we always do. And it needs to be presented. So so everything can be out in the open. And there's going to be interesting forensics in this case. Right. Are there going to be tiebacks with weapons? I'm going to be very curious. I, I, absolutely, especially from what happened at that Walmart. So that jury heard a little bit of it. And kind of even from the flavor of it, flavor of it you heard the defense saying, I wonder if the same result is going to happen this time around. We're going to follow the Markeith Lloyd case, but when we come back, an update for you in Ghislaine Maxwell. We'll be back. I'm not going to comment on anyone's status in, in, in this investigation, but I will say that we would welcome Prince Andrew coming in to talk with us. We would like to have the benefit of his statement. So if it applies to the 1784 from other crimes, you know, with the Kepler and Kepler, would you be surprised to do that? You know, I have no further comment beyond what I just said, which is that our doors remain open, as we've, as we've previously said, and we would welcome him coming in and giving us an opportunity to hear his statement. Ah, uh, do you remember when Audrey Strauss said that upon the arrest of Ghislaine Maxwell, Jeffrey Epstein's associate, who's in jail on charges of recruiting minors into a sex trafficking ring and ultimately lying under oath about it? Well, apparently, prosecutors have acknowledged that the investigation into co-conspirators is ongoing and they don't want to jeopardize anything. So, Terry, this is big because we have learned that there is some sort of grand jury investigation underway. Uh, we don't know more details about it. There have been those who have speculated, does this mean more charges are following and possibly soon? What do you make of that? Jesse, this is a case that just keeps on giving. I do think there might be additional charges. I don't know if those charges will be against Prince Andrew. I mean, we have other people who have been involved with this entire scheme. Obviously, we could have some additional charges as far as Maxwell is concerned. She already has six counts of trafficking. We could add some additional counts there. She has perjury charges. I'm not sure if we get additional charges there. But I do think that the authorities are continuing to investigate this because there have been so many people who have been damaged by what occurred with this whole sex ring. So, yes, I do think we will see more in this case. Gene, let's read the, through the tea leaves, if we can, a little bit. We don't know this, but is she cooperating right now? Is that what's going on? Is Maxwell giving up names? Is she working on a deal? Is that what's happening behind the scenes? Or is she not at that point yet, based upon how this generally looks and based upon the communications that have been coming forward from the prosecution? Uh, do you think that there's some sense of cooperation at this point with her, or is that premature to think? I think it's premature. I don't get the feeling at this point she's cooperating. But I can tell you about the uh, Southern District of New York and, and other U.S. attorney's offices. Right now, they're going to probably set a trial for uh, Ms. Maxwell. And I, I would be surprised if the government is totally prepared for that trial. And the best way to get a new trial date is to supersede and add conspirators to Ms. Ma Ms. Maxwell. And I predict that you're going to see a superseding indictment probably within the next three months of maybe two to three more individuals. And this is based on their continuing investigation and grand jury. And this is the thing about the grand jury. They can investigate new conspirators and new crimes, but they can't build a case against Ms. Maxwell. So that's what they're doing now. They're using that grand jury to find more conspirators and also maybe additional crimes, not just against Ms. Maxwell, but other people. So I don't think she's cooperating yet, but in the next month or two after discovery is informally exchanged by the uh, government with the defense or formally, when the defense attorney sees some of the evidence, then at that point, when they can really collate the information, I think she may cross that Rubicon and start cooperating. Gene, let me just follow up with that real quick. If that's the case, wouldn't these individuals have to be high profile enough 
I mean, if you're thinking if it's oh. a low-level fish or someone who doesn't, she doesn't have a lot of information about that, it has to be bigger than her, right? I, I, what I always say is if you're going to supersede, you're not going to go after minnows. You're going to go after someone who is, you know, whoever they, whomever they charge is probably going to be high profile or significant. You're going to try to charge somebody on the same managerial plane as mix, as allegedly Mix Maxwell was, and it'll be somebody who'll probably be on the same plane or right below her uh, on the hierarchy chart. It may not be Miss, Mr. And, uh, Prince Andrew. It could be somebody we've right. never heard of. It could be somebody we've never heard of, but well, it's based on discovery that they are gathering through the grand jury process. So you mentioned Prince Andrew. Uh, there's a new documentary on the crime investigation uh, UK channel, and it's called uh, Surviving Jeffrey Epstein. And yep. one of the people to speak is uh, alleged victim Virginia Giuffre, uh, who's accused very high-profile people of being sexual abusers, including Prince Andrew. Let's just play a quick snippet of that, and then we're going to get into something that she alleged that's uh, pretty, pretty out there. We'll be back. The massage seems legitimate at first. They said, take off your clothes. These were rich and, and powerfully persuasive people. At 16, what happens if I say no? So I, I stripped down. It turned, into, it turned very sexual. And it was abuse straight away. So, Terry, one of the things that she alleges is that Maxwell would play this kind of guessing game with the, the other person, including Prince Andrew, and he would guess what age Roberts was. Uh, I should say Virginia Giuffre now, but what age she was. And he guessed correctly that she was 17. And according to her, she said, according to her, she said that uh, Prince Andrew said, oh, my daughters are a few years younger than you. If that is true, Terry, what do you make of that? Jesse, if that is true, that is horrible. The fact that, first of all, they're playing a game. These are people's lives. These women, these young girls at the time, were deeply affected by what occurred. And the fact that they're playing games, the fact that he's talking about his daughters being same age or younger is just horrible. And if, in fact, Prince Andrew or anyone else involved in these conversations are brought and are indicted and are tried, that will be evidence that will really hurt their chances because it does show that they have a depraved mind and that they are seeking to have sex with young girls who are underaged. And it's really just hard to even think about. Joseph, I'll give you the final word. From an investigative point of view, how complicated is this? Because we're trying to read between the lines about what's happening. Yeah, we're not just talking about something that has occurred within the U.S. jurisdiction that the feds are looking at. We're looking at international. Uh, you know, I got to tell you, I watched the 60 Minutes piece out of Australia with Virginia. And one of the things that, if I remember correctly, uh, and it might have been from the Vanity fair piece, I can't recall, they've run together after a while. She had mentioned being present at a sex party uh, on, uh, on this island uh, in the Caribbean. And something that has haunted me from, this, from, from that moment, she talked about that there were multiple young girls in that room engaged in sex with Epstein and another person. Uh, and these girls were speaking what she thought sounded like Slavic or Eastern European uh, languages. Yeah. And my thought, and I'll leave it with this, how did those girls get from Eastern Europe to the Caribbean? How did they get to New Mexico, all these other places? And what happened to them? These are just the girls we know about. Kids from Eastern Europe, they're trafficked right. all the time. This is a big, big story, Jesse. And I, I'd like to have answers from an investigative perspective. You've got Interpol involved in this thing, as well as the FBI, the Justice Department, and Scotland Yard. Well, we... Well, we have about a year until her trial starts. There's a lot that can happen between now and then, as Jean was saying, and perhaps we'll get more answers. But as every day goes on, we just hear more disturbing allegations in this whole sordid affair. Now, speaking of sex crimes, when we come back, we have to focus on Harvey Weinstein and Kellen Winslow. Updates in both of their cases. Stay tuned.
this case is not a he said, she said. Reject that theory too. How could this case possibly be a he said, she said? This case is a she said, and she said, and she said, and she said, and she said. Five separate women, five separate victims, all of whom have been confirmed and corroborated by each other. This man is a sexual predator who acted and victimized against every single one of these women. You as jurors have a duty to reject the defense theories because they're unreasonable. You have a duty to render true and just verdicts based upon the reasonable assessment of the evidence. The court have told you that direct evidence can prove a fact by itself. And we're talking about Kellen Winslow, the former NFL tight end who was convicted and ultimately pled guilty to multiple sex crimes involving five women. Now, his sentencing was supposed to happen many months ago, but guess what happened? The coronavirus pandemic. No big shocker there. It's put a wrench in a lot of legal issues so far. Now, the defense and the state just can't seem to agree on when that hearing is going to happen. So, Terry, I'll start with you. The defense is saying push it to 2021. The state has asked for November. A status conference, uh, status conference has been set for October. How is this going to play out? I think the state has a good argument that they should proceed in either October or November. We can't wait until next year or until there is no COVID-19. You've seen across the country that many other cases are having preliminary hearings. They are having trials. They are doing it behind either closed doors or on Zoom. And I do think Obviously, the defendant has a right to be there in person, but this is the sentencing. It's not even the trial. And I think that the court will make adjustments and should make adjustments. And I don't think that under these certain circumstances that the defendant has the right to wait until the virus is gone. That could never, you know, we are all hoping that that will be soon, but we don't know. So I think that they're going to have to make adjustments and proceed. Let me just hit you with a follow-up question, Terry. You know, does time affect his sentence at all? He's expecting 12 to 18 years in prison. Does this affect the prosecution or the defense in the sentencing hearing at all, or what the judgment ultimately will be? You know, it's interesting you should ask that. I re-watched the plea deal that Winslow took, and I don't think it will affect the sentencing, but I do think there is a small chance that Winslow might actually try to get out of the plea. It took him forever to say, yes, I waive my rights. Yes, mm -hmm. I understand what's going on. And I'm thinking in the back of my mind that he might try to pull a trick one and, and do something to undo that plea. Wow. And, you know, I, I don't know, but it, it seems interesting that they're stalling and delaying at this point. I'll tell you what, let's go back to that moment in court when he started pleading guilty to these crimes. Watch. The testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right, you can have a seat. Uh, at this time, uh, Mr. Owens, I think you are moving to amend the information out of count nine. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. All right. The, uh, admission of guilt as to the uh, felony sexual battery related to Jane Doe 1. Okay, so at this time you move the court to allow the amendment of the information to add a count nine, which is violation of Penal Code Section 243.4, sexual battery with an offense date of March 17, 2018, with the victim being Jane Doe number one, a 54-year-old woman. Is that correct? That is correct, and it would be the Penal Code Section 243.4, subsection A. Okay, all right, and the... Uh, court will allow that amendment. Is there any objection by the defense? No, oh, yeah. Okay. With that said, then, the uh, count nine has been added to the information. And uh, Mr. Winslow, I'm going to ask you a series of questions, all right? I've gone over your change of plea form. Have you had any uh, drugs or alcohol or any narcotics at all within the last 24 hours? No, we don't. All right. I have a, in my hand a change of plea form. It's four pages long. And on this change of plea form, there are some initials on the right-hand side of the pages and a signature on the third page. Is this your signature, and are these your initials on this change of plea form? Yes, Your Honor. All right, before you signed and initialed this form, 
Did you have a chance to read what was on the form? Yes. And did you discuss the contents of this form with your attorneys? Yes. Do you thoroughly understand the contents of this form? Yes. And were you able to thoroughly discuss the contents of this form with your attorneys? Yes. Right. And I know we've had a long lunch hour and you spent the last, well, about two and a half hours talking. Well, that was him pleading guilty, and as Terry said, who knows what will happen between now and then, but whenever his sentencing hearing is, we hope to cover it here on Long Crime. Now, I want to turn from one high-profile figure who was uh, talking about one high-profile high figure who was ultimately convicted of sex crimes to another, Harvey Weinstein. He's facing many years behind bars for sexually abusing women. And do you remember when he started, this all started back in 2017 from the publication of that New York Times article, and then his former production house, the Weinstein Company, axed him, threw him out? Well, that's where it brings us to what's happening right now, because even despite the fact that he's in prison on a 23-year sentence for his convictions in New York and he faces charges in L.A., he is pursuing a wrongful termination claim through arbitration uh, against the Weinstein Company, or at least that's what he's trying to do. So, Gene, let me turn it to you. Apparently, his contract uh, had allowed for arbitration. And he wants the bankruptcy judge, because the Weinstein Company uh, is in bankruptcy, to allow this, to allow this arbitration claim. Is that going to happen? No. And I'll tell you why. Uh, the bankruptcy judge is going to smell a rat, and he's going to see that this is just a, an attempt by Mr. Weinstein to squeeze any ounce of fat out of that bankruptcy, because once it goes into bankruptcy, you have administrative fees that go to the lawyers uh, for the debtor, and the estate of the bankruptcy may be diminished, and he won't get anything. So this is sort of, to me, a Hail Mary pass uh, trying to enforce the arbitration clause uh, of his contract, which probably has a Now, clause. why is he doing this? Why is he doing this? Because I, is the idea <laughs> that he wants money for his legal fees, he wants to support his family? I mean, the idea of him fighting him being fired seems like the least of his worries. <laughs> He's doing this because he needs money and his, his company's in bankruptcy, and this is his way to squeeze any bit of money out of the bankruptcy. Uh, but the problem is that uh, he's probably there's a, probably a clause in the contract that specifically applies to his being convicted of serious crimes. That's a good point. And, you know, let's say, Terry, let's say this goes to arbitration. Let's say the judge allows it, goes to arbitration. Wasn't the Weinstein Company correct to fire him? I mean, isn't that the real issue here when you think about it, when you talk about wrongful termination law? Uh, if this was a guy who was publicly accused of sexually abusing multiple women over decades in this New York Times piece, how would that ultimately play out? I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, if you don't have a right to fire someone who has been convicted at this point of sexual crimes, and at that point he certainly had been accused, I think you definitely would have a right to do that. And I think any sort of arbitration that they owe him some money because it's a wrongful discharge is going to fail. And I can't even imagine. I mean, arbitration, you think of when something is arbitrated, that they come to some sort of agreement or consensus as yeah. to an amount. I can't even see the attorneys for the Weinstein Company or the bankruptcy saying that we will pay you any sum of money. And I agree also, again, with Gene, that he's doing this because he has high legal fees and he does want to squeeze yep. something out of the company. It, it, it's such a mess. It's such a mess for him. And to think about how much has changed in three years for Harvey Weinstein, how much has changed for him in the last year, six months, nobody would have thought it. Well, I want to thank my guests, Joseph Scott Morgan, Gene Rossi, Terry Austin. Great as always. I want to thank everybody out there for joining us. Until next time, be safe and we'll see you then.